We're happy that Lou is able to tell his journey and his grandfather's journey tonight. His grandfather actually came from the same region that the Venetian Club original members came from, so that in the Free Willy region, so we're very proud of that too. So Lou is from Port Chester, New York, which is about 25 miles north of uh, Manhattan. He's a nationally recognized children's storyteller and a five-time Parents' Choice Award winner. His CDs for kids have received critical praise from many publications. Tonight's talk about Lou's grandfather, Luigi, was actually performed at Mount Rushmore. After 25 years, the Del Bianco family is pleased to announce that Luigi is finally being recognized for his unique contribution as Chief Carver on our nation's most iconic memorial. Lou Del Bianco. Thank you so much. It is uh, it's so great to be here. This is my first time in Michigan. Yeah. Yay! I love it. I love it. Is it always this beautiful? Like dry, no humidity, blue sky, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I'm really jealous. <laughs> I, I think I'll be coming back. I, 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 I know I'm coming back. Um, I, thank you so much for, for joining me this evening for a very special story uh, for myself and for my family. And I'm so happy to share it with you. Uh, I am a uh, professional storyteller. I've been telling stories for about 34 years. But this story is unique because it's about somebody in my life, in my family. It's about my grandpa. I guess you can tell who the grandson is and who the grandfather is. <laughs> that's me, Lou, and that's my grandpa, my nonno, Luigi. I was my grandfather's only grandson and his namesake. And in the Italian culture, that is a very big deal. So my grandpa and I had a really, a really special bond. Uh, on certain days, he loved to show me something he made with his own two hands. The first time I saw this, I thought this was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. This is a marble bust that my grandfather carved of his own likeness when he was a young man. I could remember standing on a chair and my grandpa taking my little five-year-old fingers and tracing them along his marble Roman profile. I would put his fedora on his own carved head, as you see there. But what I remember most of all was my grandpa taking me by the shoulders, and in a very serious voice he would say, I am Luigi. You are Luigi. Two years later, I'm in my room, and I find this. And I ask my mother, Ma, what's this? And when my mother tells me, my jaw drops to the floor. Can I show this to my class at school? Now, I have to tell you, when I was a little boy, I was extremely shy. It might have had to do with the fact that I was one brother with six sisters. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say that again if you hadn't heard Six sisters. <laughs> But hearing this information gave me a confidence I never thought I had. And I can still remember standing in front of my second grade class, proudly holding that pamphlet and saying, I want to tell you about my grandpa. And that's why I'm here tonight, everybody. I want to tell you about my grandpa. His name was Luigi Del Bianco. And he was the only chief carver, the master carver on this, the Mount Rushmore National Memorial. I'm so happy to say that my grandfather is finally part of our American history, and this is his unique story. So here it is, Mount Rushmore. It's known the world over, right? It's iconic. I'm curious, can you please raise your hand if you've been to Mount Rushmore? Oh, get oh, that's right, you're much closer than I am in New York, aren't I? I always forget that. <laughs> but that's great to see so many hands. Um, so you probably know that it's located in this orange-colored state called South Dakota. And there are four presidents that are honored on Mount Rushmore. Uh, people always ask me, why these four presidents? Well, the designer, Gutzon Borglum, saw this as the shrine of democracy. And he thought these four presidents all contributed or expanded our democracy in a profound way. Uh, George Washington started our democracy by uh, being the first president. 
Thomas Jefferson expanded the democracy uh, with the Louisiana Purchase. He also wrote a little piece of paper called the Declaration of Independence. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt's a little, little, little complicated. Uh, he certainly contributed to the expansion of democracy by overseeing the completion of the Panama Canal. And he also was a conservationist, so he protected and started many national parks and national forests. He was also a good friend of the designer Guts and Borglum, just a little FYI. And then, of course, Abraham Lincoln, who saved our democracy by freeing the slaves and keeping our union together. So there they are, the four presidents honored on Mount Rushmore. Now, obviously, these four men are seen as heroes. Uh, they are iconic, and they are respected by millions. Um, I think it's also important to note that there are other people who do not see these uh, presidents as heroes. They see them as the opposite. Um, I find myself uh, having respect for both views. Um, but for all intents and purposes, the hero in this story is my grandpa. So I just want to be clear about that. Okay, this is a gentleman who um, you're going to hear a lot about tonight. This is Guts and Borglum, the brilliant sculptor, engineer, stone carver who figured out how to carve 60-foot faces on the side of a mountain. Today, that would seem like an impossible task. There were 400 men who helped Borglum carve these faces. But you should know that Borglum had only one assistant, the only classically trained stone carver who refined the faces and gave them their expression. That artist was my grandpa. Now, my grandfather lived in America for 49 years, but he wasn't born here. He was born in, you guessed it, <laughs> Italy, way up north in a region north of Venice called Friuli Venezia Giulia, which Dave uh, touched upon. Uh, in 1910, my grandfather was 18 years old, and he wanted to come to America to carve something special. So he wrote to relatives in Bari, Vermont, to sponsor him. I, I do this program for elementary school children, uh, and I always ask them, do you think my grandfather sent an email to his relatives in Bari, Vermont? No, this is what he sent, a postcard. And that postcard had to get on a boat for three weeks from Italy to America. And then when the relatives wrote back, it got back on a boat for another three weeks. It took six weeks to communicate from Italy to America. Today with email, how long would it take? Seconds. Man, how, how much slower life was back then, huh? So to make a long story short, my grandfather makes a couple of trips back and forth from Italy to America. He settles in Barry, Vermont in 1910, goes back in 1915 to fight with the Italian army in World War I comes back to Italy in 1920. He meets Borglum. Borglum makes my grandfather his assistant all throughout the 1920s working on different projects. We could talk about that later in the Q&A if you want. Uh, but in 1933, that is when uh, Borglum hired my grandfather to be the chief carver on Mount Rushmore. My grandfather had the most important job, carving the refinement of expression in the faces. When you see the humanity in these faces, as if they could live and breathe, that is from the hands of Luigi Del Bianco, and that is a fact. So let's take a little trip back in time, okay? This is Mount Rushmore the way you know it. I'm going to show you Mount Rushmore in 1936. Isn't that great? You can't even see Theodore Roosevelt's fate. It's, it's obscured with scaffolds. Uh, there are scaffolds all over Washington's face. The men would work in those so they wouldn't fall to their death. Believe it or not, nobody died while carving Mount Rushmore. I know that's hard to believe, but that is true. And there's my nonno, Luigi, the artist, the proud artist, standing with the five-foot models. And by the way, if you look at the way my grandfather is dressed... Uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, so let's imagine that my, my grandpa is he's uh, measuring the eye of Abraham Lincoln. And as he measures the eye, he likes to have a little conversation with his favorite president. It might go a little something like this. <clears throat> oh, ah, that shoulder. There's never a dull moment. Bite it. Okay. Stay. Don't, don't behave. <clears throat> Ah, President Lincoln, buongiorno. Today we carve the eye. 
But first, we measure the points on the eye. Avanti. <laughs> My friend, Mr. Lincoln, why do all the people say you have an ugly face? <laughs> to me, you have a beautiful face. I know this face, every bump, every line. Quanta si bello. <laughs> Amici, buongiorno. Everyone say buongiorno. buongiorno. Va bene. You come to watch Luigi work, eh? Yeah. Hey, look. Amici, do you know where you are? I'm going to tell you where you are. You are in the studio of the genius, the master, Mr. Gutson Borlam. Amici, every day, the master and me, we try to find the best way to measure the small face and move that measurement to the big face on the mountain. In the morning, I measure the small eye. In the afternoon, I carve the big eye. Ah, sono io Luigi. I am carving the eye of the president. Do you see the eye, Amici? Look at the nose in back of me. Do you know when I carve, the sun beats the back of my head? It is so hot, and I sweat, and the wind blows my scaffold. I feel like I'm going to fall out. And the dust from the stone makes my face white like a ghost. And the drill that I hold in my hands is 45 pounds. Mamma mia! And when I carve the eye, I do it eh, 500 feet in the air. I take this photo on top of the head of President Washington. And Amici. All the 400 men in Luigi, how do we get to the top every day to work on the faces? 706 steps. È vero, every day, up and down, up and down. That's like halfway up the Empire State Building. This is my daily record of my work on the wig of President Jefferson. Oh, and because I am Chief Carver, they pay me more than anyone else. Prima Costa. One dollar and fifty cents an hour. <laughs> hey, amici, remember, this is the 1930s, the Depression. There is no work. A dollar fifty an hour is very good pay. Ah, my friends, all this time I don't tell you my name. Sono Luigi del Bianco, chief carver on Mount Rushmore. I come from Italy to America to live and to work and to carve. Ma, I miss my family. So I bring my wife, Nicoletta. She is Abruzzese, che bellezza. I bring my sons, Silvio, Cesare, and Vincenzo to live with me in South Dakota while I carve the faces. My boys, they love to live in the Black Hills. Do you know what they love, Amici? They love, um, eh, come si dice? Eh, Cowboys and Indians. <laughs> in fact, the one looking down, Vincenzo, <laughs> he thinks he's an Indian. He wants to ride every horse he sees. And I tell you something else about my son. He doesn't listen to anybody. You want to hear how I do it? <laughs> one day I say to my son, Vincenzo, do you see that horse over there? That horse belongs to my boss, Guts and Borlum. You cannot ride that horse, Vincenzo. And Vincenzo smiles at me, and he promises not to ride the horse, and I leave. And when I go, what do you think Vincenzo does? Scorch men. He gets on top of that horse. He says, I am an Indian chief. This is my horse now. And then Vincenzo looks down, and who do you think is standing next to the horse? My boss, Guts and Borlam. And Borlam says, Vincenzo, what are you doing on my horse? And Vincenzo smiles. And Mr. Borlam smiles. And Mr. Borlam puts his hand on the back of my son's neck. And he squeezes tight. And Mr. Borlam picks up my son. And he throws Vincenzo off the horse. And my little boy flies through the air like a little bird. A beep ba 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 beep ba 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 boom My wife, Nicoletta, sees this. Do you think she's happy? Let me tell you something about my wife, Amici. She's a piccinina. That means she's only four feet to ten inches tall. She's a tiny, huh? She doesn't care. She walks up to Mr. Borglum. She looks up at him and says, You touch my son again? I won't allow your husband to come back to carve your faces. 
This is my boss my wife is talking to like this, Amici. Mr. Bordelum looks down at my wife and says, Mrs. Del Bianco, whatever you say. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife has the respect of the master. And Vincenzo says to me, Papa, I'm sorry I don't listen to you. I say, that's all right, Vincenzo, because you never listen to me. <laughs> but if you want to learn to ride a horse, I get my brothers to teach you. Would you like to meet my brothers? Amici, I show you my brothers. Guarda, my brothers. <laughs> Why, you don't think these are my brothers? Amici, I Luigi. I become a blood brother with the chief of Lakota Sioux Indians. Do you see the Indian with the headdress? Very molto famoso Indian. Chief Black Elk, huh? And his friend on the other side, he teaches my son to ride a horse. And Mr. Borglum says, now you could ride my horse. And Vincenzo, he does, and look at my boy, he's so happy. And to thank the chief, I carve his beautiful face, quanta si bello. And Amici, every Sunday, my wife, Nicoletta, do you know what she does? We go to the, uh, uh, come se dice, the reservation. And my wife, she cooks macaroni and sauce for the whole Indian tribe. <laughs> the ladies, the Indian ladies, they want to learn how to cook my wife's sauce. She teaches them. Huh? <laughs> and before we eat, I say two things. Everyone, please say this. Everyone say, salute. salute. Say, cent'anni. Good health, 100 years. Ah. Ecco, these are the American men, americani. They are the men that I teach to carve the faces. They are like my brothers too, Amici. But do you think these men are artists like Luigi? No, these men work underground in the coal mine, the silver mine. Very dangerous work, Amici. But then the depression comes. These men have no work. So Mr. Borlam, he does something crazy. He hires these men, and I have to teach them how to carve the faces. Impossible. But these men are very smart. These men are very brave. Can you do that? These men are very strong. And together, I teach them to carve the faces, and they become like my brothers. They like me. They like the stories I tell, how I fight with the Italian army during World War I, and the Germans shoot me 13 times and I do not die. I tell them how I come to America to be American. Amici, I meet this president, huh? Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He shakes my hand and he asks me, Del Bianco, is that Italian? <laughs> And I say, ha ha, 100 per cent. <laughs> ah, amici, I'm sorry, I talk too much. In Italian, we say, chiacchieron, I talk too much. I have to get back to work. I have to finish these faces. Each face, Amici, 60 feet tall. The nose, 21 feet long. The mouth, 18 feet wide. Can you imagine the size of the meatball my wife would have to make for a mouth that big? That's a big meatball. I make a joke, eh? My friends in Port Chesaday ask me, Luigi, how do you carve these faces? They're so big. I say, Maronne me, my friends, this is a unique process. Amici, maybe I show you how we carve the faces, eh? And maybe you can help me. Let's look at Mount Rushmore before the faces are there, before we begin. Very different, huh? The outside is very dark. We have to get beneath the dark to get to the light stone. And Amici, the first thing we must do before we carve the faces is point. Please, everyone say point. This is a five-foot model of George Washington. Do you see the pole sticking out of the side, the top of his head? And the string that comes down, there is a weight at the bottom of the string that is called a pointing machine, Amici. And my job is to use the pointing machine to measure a point on the small face. Maybe I measure the location of the tip of Washington's nose. And then I take that point and I move it 
to the big face with a big pointing machine. And that tells me the location on the big face. And we move many points from little face to big face to shape the face and duplicate it. Can you imagine we must move 10,000 points, Amici? And we have to be perfect when we move the points. Because if we take off too much stone, can we put it back? You have to be perfect when you point. So please, everyone say, point. Va bene. Next, we blast. You cannot take off the stone with a hammer and a chisel. The faces are too big. We take off 85% of the stone on Mount Rushmore with dynamite. And again, Amici, you have to be perfect when you blast. If you blast off too much stone, can you put it back? No. So everyone say, point blast. Very good. Then we drill. Look at the men. They are drilling down, down, down to within maybe three inches of each measured point. Thousands of times we drill for each point, and you see the face slowly come to life. This is President Washington. Uh, unfortunately, his face is a little faccia bruta right now, but it's going to get better, I promise you, okay? <laughs> Everyone say, point, blast, drill. Then we honeycomb. Kesso Chesso, what is this honeycomb? Sono io, Luigi. I am drilling holes very close together. Huh? Why do I do that? Because it gives me more control when I break off those holes. And that takes us to the finish part of the face. Everyone say, point, blast, drill, honeycomb. Perfetto, perfetto. And then we finish. Sono io Luigi. I am on the mountain, and they bring down to me a five-foot mask of Abraham Lincoln. On the other side, very close to me, is the 60-foot face. And now we do not measure. We finish. I use the hands of the artist to study the small face, and then I go and finish the big face and give it all the expression it needs. And when I am done, it looks a little like this. So that is the five-part process of how we carve the faces. First I say, and then you say. Point, blast, drill, honeycomb, finish. And? Point, blast, drill, honeycomb, finish. Bravissima, bravissima. Give yourselves a round of applause. You're so good. Thank you so much. <laughs> My friends in Porchester, they say to me, Luigi, do you have many problems when you try to carve these faces? And I say, Mamma Mia, you have no idea how many times we have to change the models. 13 times. Oh, very hard work. But I tell you, we don't give up. We always find another way. I'm going to show you the original model of Mount Rushmore. Eh? Very different, eh? Why did we not carve the body below the faces. I'm going to tell you, Amici, because the stone below the faces, much of it is bad stone for carving. It is called pegmatite stone. It is filled with crystals called mica and quartz. When you try to carve stone with crystals inside, oh, the stone falls apart. You understand, huh? And we have a big problem. We cannot carve the stone with crystals inside. So what do we do? We don't give up. We decide to just carve the faces the way you see them today. And I think they look very nice that way. Eh? Do you agree? This is how we start. This is how we finish. Hey, che successo? That's President Jefferson. What's he doing over there? Did you know President Jefferson was supposed to be the first face on the mountain? But what happens? We hit the pegmatite stone, Amici. Mike, a quartz. The face falls apart when we carve. We have a big problem. But we don't give up. We take dynamite and we blast off the bad face. And we put Mr. Jefferson on the other side of Washington where you see him today. And this is why President Roosevelt, he looks a little a smushy smushy, you know? Because he had, he had to move over. But I think he's okay now, huh? <laughs> Ah, sono io Luigi. I am carving the lip of President Jefferson. Amici, one day I am home. I have my, my wine and my radio, and I sing my Italian music. Maybe I sing a little Italian song for you, huh? A little song. Uno momento. 
Oh, sole mio, sta in fronte a te. Oh, sole mio, sta in fronte a te. Oh, sole, oh, sole mio, sta in fronte a te. Sta in fronte a te. Grazie tante, thank you so much. Grazie. You're very kind, thank you. Oh, but when I finish singing, I get a letter from Mr. Borlam, and he says, Bianco, you must come to the mountain subito. There is a dangerous crack of pegmatite stone in the lip of Jefferson. It grows and it grows, and I trust only you can fix it. If you do not come, we may lose the face a second time. Hey, Amici, what do I do? I get in my car, and I drive for 1,800 miles to South Dakota. And uh, because there is no Italian food in South Dakota, I put in the back seat of my car provolone, soprasette, gabagola, parmesan, because I have to have my Italian food, eh? <laughs> and I walk up those 706 steps, Amici, and I take out that bad crack. And I put in a new piece of stone, and I carve it, and I finish it, and Amici, when I am done, you cannot even tell the crack was there. So I guess you can say that I, Luigi, yeah, I saved the face of uh, Thomas Jefferson. Ah. <laughs> ah, Amici, I look at my watch. I have to leave you now. I have to finish measuring the eye of President Lincoln. But before I go, I say one more thing. When I was a little boy in Italy, I have a big dream to come to America to carve something special. Amici, does my dream come true? This is my passion, to be an artiste. My friends, do you have a dream? Do you, do you, do you have a passion? Do you have something you love to do every day? I tell you, do it. Work hard. Live your life. Give the gift you have. Live life. La vita bella. I am Luigi Del Bianco, and I say to you, and please you say back to me, ciao. Let's have a big hand for my grandpa. No, no, thank you. Thank you so much. You're a great audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're, that's my grandpa, you know? He was an Italian immigrant. He came to America to carve presidents' faces. Is that the American dream, or is that the American dream? And this is his amazing story. You know, a lot of people ask me, what did your grandfather do after Mount Rushmore? I mean, how do you follow <laughs> Mount Rushmore? Well, my grandfather was a gifted artist, but he was like so many of our ancestors. Doesn't matter what nationality. They came here for work. They came here to feed. The, they came here for a better life. And they were grateful, grateful for the work. And so my grandfather gratefully carved 500 headstones by hand as a memorial stone carver in my hometown. He actually is buried in that same cemetery, so he lies in peace surrounded by his own work, which is pretty amazing. He, he was so proud to be American, but he never forgot his roots. He went back to Italy and Friuli many, many times. Oh, this is kind of a sidebar. My grandfather had a paisano in Friuli, and he was the first heavyweight Italian boxer. Does anybody want to guess who it is? It's Primo, Primo Carnera. This is Primo Carnera, if you don't know who this is. He held the record for the, being the tallest boxer, the heaviest, and the biggest fists. In fact, my grandfather has a, made a mold of his fists that he made copies of, and they're all over the place. Uh, there's a legend uh, that when my great-grandfather, Vincenzo, died, Primo insisted on being the only pallbearer at the funeral. And by the look of him, he could have done it. He probably did do it. Uh, my grandfather was honored with a plaque by the National Sculpture Society. Okay, now everybody always asks me this. Which of these three little boys became my father? Unfortunately, it was Vincenzo, who didn't listen to anybody. And let me tell you something, that never changed. <laughs> 
But my father really loved living in the Black Hills. He loved the Midwest. He would have loved Michigan too, I'm sure. He didn't want to come back to New York. It was really, a, he really had a feeling for it. And he always wanted to go back and ride a horse again in Mount Rushmore. So here he is at seven, and here, he's, here he is again at 65 riding a horse at Mount Rushmore. Isn't that great? But nobody threw him off this time. He was a little too big. Uh, this is my Aunt Gloria. She wasn't even born when Mount Rushmore was being carved, but I, I want to acknowledge her because she's my grandfather's only surviving child. She's so proud of her papa's great accomplishment. There's that beautiful bust again. Uh, let, let me show you some other things that my grandfather carved. That's a, a bust of my Uncle Silvio when he was just 16. Yes, it's a bronze. It's a bronze. It's exactly right. Uh, a uh, mosaic of Abraham Lincoln. Just great. George Washington. Obviously, Mount Rushmore had an effect on my grandfather. He carved, did all of this after afterwards. Teddy Roosevelt. This is called motherhood. Just beautiful. Okay, now I had a passion and a desire myself to fulfill a dream. I always wanted to do this show at Mount Rushmore. So I talked to the staff in 2011 and told them that for a very reasonable fee, I would perform throughout the whole 4th of July weekend. Their response was, well, we really don't have a budget to pay you. And I thought, okay, I'll come and do it for nothing. That's how much this means to me. And the response was, well, we really don't have room on the schedule for you. So I decided if my grandfather could persevere the way he did in his life, I'm going to persevere. So I very politely harassed the staff for about two months, writing, writing and calling every day, and I guess I wore them down. Because here's my grandpa in the studio in 1936. Here I am in the same studio in 2011, dressed like him, becoming him. I am Luigi, you are Luigi. It's just a day that I will never, ever, ever forget. This is the Italian American Museum in Manhattan where there is an exhibit about the Italian chief carver. I've been trying to spread this story everywhere. I even, I've gone to television too and I made a breakthrough. Check this out. Oh, wait a minute now. I would like you to make a Mount Rushmore cake. I'm excited. We are going to be here for a recognition that he deserves. Fantastic. should be over a little bit. You're moving too much. Oh, you got a lot of ice cream. <laughs> All right, well, let's cut that. Call it. If you wet your brush with a little aqua, go over what I go over. That's a cake. Are you familiar with the Cake Boss program? Yeah, Buddy Velastro uh, was just so pleased to honor my grandfather in a special way. We, he made a seven foot high Mount Rushmore cake. We had a Luigi Del Bianco day. And now the millions of people who watch the show know about uh, the Italian Chief Carver. I, rea I realized that many people in my own hometown had never heard of my grandfather. So I raised uh, money and had a memorial plaque uh, engraved for him done by sculptor Michael Koropian so that poor Chester would never forget him. I'm a firm believer in preserving history and I get the feeling because you're here that you feel the same way. I made a website, LuigiMountRushmore.com. You can go to this website and find out more about my grandfather's unique story. You could also find out another part of this story, which is just as interesting as the first part. And why do I say that? Well, I have to start with this book. This is the definitive book on Mount Rushmore. It's called The Carving of Mount Rushmore, written by Rex Allen Smith. Uh, my grandfather is not mentioned once. Yep, <laughs> pretty shocking, right? The chief carver, who was the only one who refined the faces, is not, it's as if he never existed. I could still remember my, gr my uncle Caesar slamming the table and saying, that's like talking about the New York Yankees and not mentioning DiMaggio. <laughs> and you know, I thought that was a very good analogy. You know, my uncle's reaction brought me back to that connection I had with my grandfather. 
I am Luigi, you are Luigi. So my uncle and I decided to team up and find out the rest of the story, because obviously history doesn't always give you the whole story. It started with my first pilgrimage to Mount Rushmore in 1988. I asked the staff, where is the plaque honoring the chief carver? This is what they showed me. This is a plaque of all the 400 people associated with the Mount Rushmore project, from laborers to drillers to secretaries to the man who put the soul into the faces. To me, it was like taking Clark Gable out of Gone with the Wind and making him an extra. That's what I think they were doing to my grandpa. So my uncle and I decided to roll up our sleeves and go to Washington, D.C., the biggest library in the world, to research the guts and Borglum papers to find out once and for all what the truth was. This is my uncle Caesar. He's not with us anymore, but I know he smiles down on me every time I do this program. Let me just read to you some of the papers that were found. Um, I'm just going to move a little bit here so I can get a better uh, look. Uh, this, is a, this is a letter that uh, Borglum wrote to the, to the Mount Rushmore Commission, which was the body uh, in charge of the work and also in charge of cutting the checks for the workers. Uh, he was complaining in 1933 about the way his chief carver was being treated. He complained to me within a week of the treatment he was being accorded from the Rapid City office. Rudeness, insolence, and petty dickering about wages. He remained here on my orders and my account, but he will never come again. We discovered that my grandfather quit Mount Rushmore several times because of bullying, harassment, and his life being made miserable. The powers that be did not want him there. Board continues, he is worth any three men I could find in America for this particular type of work here and now. He entirely outclassed everyone on the hill, and his knowledge was an embarrassment to their amateur efforts, lack of knowledge, lack of experience, and lack of judgment. He is the only man besides myself who has been on the work and knows the problems and how to instantly solve them. Borglum ends by saying, the loss of Bianco will prevent the finishing of the Washington and Jefferson heads this year. So think about it. Whenever my grandfather quit, all finishing had to stop. He was the only one that could do it. I doubt if anybody else left, it would have had the same effect. So Borglum is obviously desperate. He cannot continue with finishing the faces without his chief carver. So he makes a deal with the Mount Rushmore Commission. He says, I've decided we must keep Bianco and keep him happy. If he were working for me, I'd be paying him 11 or $12. I want him to receive a dollar a day from you. You can charge me with a difference. Borglum took out second and third mortgages on his house to accomplish it this way. His ability to understand, Borglum said, is much more important to the work. So my grandfather returns out of loyalty to the men that he trained, to Borglum and this great privilege granted him. And Borglum always says the same thing. He is the only intelligent, efficient stone carver on the work who understands the language of the sculptor. So my grandfather fortunately does stay on the work through 1933, 35, 36, and 37. But at the end of 37, he leaves again, vowing never to return. And Borglum writes this. For the purposes of Washington's red tape, a portion of our better men are designated as carvers. There are no carvers on the mountain. There has never been but one, and he refused to return because of the chronic sabotage directed at him by influences in Rapid City and the Parks Department. Now, sabotage is a really strong word. I don't know what the details of that sabotage was other than the problem with pay. Uh, my grandfather never talked about it. He was very proud. My older relatives never asked. I was too young to, to ask him about it. Uh, we all just have to look at the evidence and kind of come up with our own conclusion. So my grandfather is not at Rushmore for the 38 and 39 season. No Bianco, the faces aren't finished. Guts and Borglum makes one more final attempt to get my grandfather back in 1940. He writes, Dear Bianco, I wish you would come as soon as you can if you can be of help to me. I must finish the faces by the 1st of July, and all of them, I need you. Your pay will be exactly what it was before. You are the only man who was on that pay. Pretty convincing letter, huh? Pretty provocative. Well, my grandfather obviously didn't respond because Borglum writes again, You better be here by May 1st. <laughs> Borglum didn't mess around. And I'm glad you will come. You will have to work for me, and nobody else will trouble you. You can see Borglum is 
trying to assure my grandfather that this time he will finally be left alone. Well, my grandfather, in fact, returns. And he's the only man working on Rushmore in 1940. And I know this because Richard Sarazani, who wrote a book about his father, Arthur, Arthur worked with my grandfather throughout the 1940 season. And in Arthur's journal, he says, the place is as silent as a tomb. There is only one man working on the faces, and that is Bianco. What an image. This huge mountain, these huge faces, and one little person finishing the faces just the way Borglum needed him to do it. And my grandfather does. And he'll always have the admiration and respect of all of those men he trained to carve with him. We asked Matt Riley, who was trained under my grandfather, would you say he was the best carver? And Matt said, oh yes, you can see what you've got up there. George Rumpel said he was not only a carver, he was a genius. He taught me a lot, and I think if he had to take over from Mr. Borglum, he could finish the mountain himself. At the end of my grandfather's life, he had this to say about his experience. I'd do it again, knowing all the hardships involved. I would work at Rushmore, even without pay, if necessary. It was a great privilege granted me. You can imagine how excited my Uncle Caesar and I were when we presented 75 primary source documents, irrefutably proving that my grandfather wasn't only important, but vital to the completion of the Rushmore project. Well, they looked at the, uh, the um, papers, or they said they did, and you know what their response was? This is all very nice, but your grandfather was not the chief carver. He was part of a group called the Workers. No one will be singled out except Guts and Borglum. Can you believe that? For 25 years, we shared those papers with every superintendent and chief of interpretation and park ranger, and it was as if a script had been written and handed down to each successor. Your grandfather was not the chief carver. He will be, he will be credited with the group of 400 people. Well, at some point, I had to think out of the box. So I went above the heads of Mount Rushmore, which I was really um, avoiding doing because I knew it would be an insult to them but I had no choice. I went to Michael Reynolds, who was the regional director of all the national parks throughout the Midwest. And when Michael saw those papers, he was blown away. He said, wow, he said, this is really impressive stuff. You know, let me talk to the people at Rushmore, you know, and get them to change their minds. This is ridiculous. And I thought, wow, we finally made a breakthrough. I waited for a couple weeks, and then a month later, I got a letter from Michael Reynolds, and the letter said, your grandfather was not the chief carver. He was part of a group of blah, 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 blah. And I thought Rushmore got to Michael Reynolds. He folded like a cheap suit. And I really was able to, I was really ready to give up at this point. But then this guy came along. The successor of Michael Reynolds, the new, uh, the new regional director of all the Midwest parks, Cam Sholly. And I did the same thing with Cam. I gave him the documents, and he said just what Michael Reynolds said. He says, wow, this is really impressive stuff. You know what? Let me talk to the people at uh, Mount Rushmore and see if I can get them to change their minds. And I'm like, oh, God, don't talk to the people at Rushmore. Please, they'll get to you, too. But you know what? This guy was different. He did what so many people before him could have and should have done. He sent two National Park historians to go through those primary source documents. And when those historians were done, finalmente, this happened. The man depicted here was arguably a cut above the other stone carvers he worked with. But acknowledging that required a rewriting of the history of one of our nation's most beloved Jim Axelrod takes us to the Black Hills of South Dakota. Mount Rushmore's designer, Gutzen Borglum, once said he hoped the faces would remain unchanged until the wind and rain alone shall wear them away. The monument, carved into granite, was designed to be as enduring as it was inspiring. The team that created this memorial exemplifies the perseverance of the American spirit. Which is why this ceremony held yesterday was so remarkable as the National Park Service 
start to change at Mount Rushmore. Three, two, one. A small but significant revision to the story of its creation. 48 years after his death, an Italian immigrant named Luigi Del Bianco was officially recognized as Mount Rushmore's chief car. So there he is, performing a little surgery. Yeah, and his classic surgery. Oh, I was joking. And, and, and his really horrendous surgery. As Luigi Del Bianco's grandson Lou explained to us, the chief carver was the master craftsman in charge of refining the expression in the faces. So the twinkle in Lincoln's eye, yeah. or Jefferson's lips, yeah. that's Luigi Del Bianco's work? Yes. Since Rushmore's completion in 1941, the 400 laborers had always been saluted as a group. But for the last 30 plus years, the Del Bianco family had been making the case Luigi wasn't just part of the crowd. If we're looking at Rushmore, what of Luigi Del Bianco's work am I seeing that separates them out and makes him deserving of his own? Well, when people tell me their impression of the faces, they say that there's a humanity. There's a humanity in my granite. And I'm convinced that my grandfather helped bring that humanity out. Trained in Italy as a stone carver, Luigi Del Bianco came to America in 1908 at the age of 16, settling eventually in Fort Chester, New York, where he opened a business. So in Port Chester, New York, there are headstones carved by the same man who did Rushmore? Yeah, and I can't tell you how many times an older person in town would say, can you believe it? Mm -hmm. The man who carved the president's face is carved my mother's headstone. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Lou Del Bianco grew up knowing all about his grandfather's special role at Rushmore. What do we have in here? Well, those are about 75 documents from the library including testimony from Goots and Borkman. He is worth any three men I can find in America for this particular type of work here and now. This is Borgholm's right. Oh, yeah. But nothing Lou showed the Park Service would change the narrative, at least not until Cam Shally took over the regional office in charge of Russia. You know, there's a, uh, a pay sheet that has his name, Chief Carver, dollar fifty an hour. The more Shally read of what Lou sent him, the more he realized the story of Rushmore needed rewriting. I found myself wondering if, if we should change course here. So Shelley dispatched a couple of National Park Service historians to Lou's basement in Port Chester. <laughs> they went through the booklet that I showed you. By the fourth page, one of the historians said, when you sold me, let's go have lunch. <laughs> and after years of making Luigi's case, the official policy was overturned. We have Luigi Del Bianco in that visitor center. There are pictures of him, his names in there. We just have to call him Chief Carver and now we will. Well, now we all know Gustav Borglum, of course, but he didn't do it alone. There were about 400 people who helped him. The decision made at headquarters it may take a little while to filter down to the tours. We got this recognition coming to Luigi Del Bianco. It's kind of a key part of the story, isn't it? I don't know that part of the story, so I can't say. Are you going to have to brush up on Luigi? Oh, I, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but Luigi Del Bianco isn't concerned, knowing he's got history on his family's side, and now a plaque to prove it. <laughs> Let's hear it for Grandpa. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I'm very touched by all of you. Really a w wonderful audience. Uh, the, ce the ceremony took place on September 16, 2017. The family was there, and now Luigi finally has his plaque. So if you go back to Rushmore or go for the first time, I hope you'll look for Luigi. He'll be looking for you. <laughs> now, this is very, very cool. Uh, in another part of the world, another plaque was also being unveiled. Check it out. Un fiero 
This is the little village called Borgo del Bianco. It's just outside of Maduno in uh, pro uh, uh, the province of Pordenone in Friuli. Um, such a wonderful experience I had performing for De Panyuco and Michela's uh, Venetian Club. Uh, this is where my grandfather comes from. These are their people, right? These are his people. Uh, the village still looks like 1892, doesn't it? Isn't it amazing? <laughs> and I think they are just as proud of him, if not more, than we are. Uh, some prominent Americans also heard about my grandpa and chimed in. This was said by Dan Rather. I won't get into every single word, but this was said by... Uh, one of my favorite actors, Alan Alda, who's half Italian. Uh, here's my favorite. I have to read this one. I love discovering this immigrant story of Luigi Del Bianco, a master carver who brought Mount Rushmore to life with his artistry to make it one of the most recognizable man-made wonders of the world, Tony Bennett. Isn't that great? Tony Bennett knows about my grandpa. Just, just great. So, finally, history has been changed for the better. But I'm not done. I want my grandfather to become a household word. And the historians encouraged me on that day. I mean, I, I made that little joke about one of the historians about, you know, let's have lunch. But they, they took their work really seriously uh, and went through all of those papers with a fine tooth comb. I think the point of that was it was a very easy decision to make. <laughs> You know, I think that was, that was his point. Um, so they encouraged me as a storyteller to document this story, and I have, and I'm very pleased to have some copies here tonight. It's called Out of Rushmore Shadow, the Luigi Del Bianco story. Uh, what I shared with you tonight is just the tip of the iceberg. If you get the book, you'll learn more about my grandfather's interesting immigrant journey, his time at Rushmore. The book is loaded with tons of photographs and documentation. You'll also read the 25-year odyssey that reads like a Grisham novel about what we went through to get him recognized. It really did take a quarter century. Uh, no more, no less. Um, and so you, uh, oh, and by the way, I do have a couple of copies in Italian. If there's anybody here who would like to get the book in Italian, I do have them here. Yeah, Italy has embraced Luigi as well. I'm very proud to say that. Um, uh, so, so there are different ways that you could help make Luigi a household world. You, you can, of course, get my book as I subtly plug my own uh, product. Uh, uh, I love reviews on Amazon. If, if you do read the book and you really like it, and if you'd like to write, write a review, I would, I would really appreciate that. Sign my email list because I would love to come back to this area to do more venues. Um, I perform for schools, every type of organization. Uh, put your name down. Take my business card. Email me if you have a contact. I know that Dave and I have already been talking about uh, other, other possibilities. Um, and another reason why you can get on the email list is because, you know, I've been pursuing a movie about Luigi. Uh, wouldn't you love to see Luigi on the big screen? Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, you never know. Um, so, and with that, uh, before we uh, sign books and chat, uh, <laughs> does anybody have uh, any questions about my grandpa and Mount Rushmore? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because the, the, the documentary you're probably talking about is it probably the one that uh, put, was put out by the American Experience series, and that one is about 20 years old. So this is, this is way back in the days when uh, my grandfather was just completely anonymous. Uh, the good news is, is that um, the, they're updating the film at Rushmore, and he will be included in that. He's been mentioned in numerous podcasts. He's been in the media. He, his, the story is growing. I love it when I get calls from media and people in uh, entertainment who want to help tell his story. So it's all changing, and it's pretty exciting. Yes, sir. All right, great question. How was, how was the site chosen? Okay, long story short, in the early 20s, the state historian for Mount Rush for, for South Dakota, Don Robinson, was racking his brains trying to think of a way to bring tourism to the state. Because as beautiful as South Dakota was, 
there was nothing there to see other than just you know the Black Hills. So he wanted to think of a tourist attraction. So he had these, um, they had these spires in the Black Hills. They're like needles, okay? And uh, he thought uh, Western heroes like Kit Carson and, and Lewis and Clark could be carved out of those needles. So he approached the renowned sculptor Gutsum Borglum, and Borglum said, no, those needles are too precarious, uh, probably peg pegmatite stone. We need to carve on the side of a mountain, and it needs to be presidents. So Borglum had the idea for a mountain, and he got on a donkey with his 12-year-old son, Lincoln, and he picked Mount Rushmore. And one of the reasons he picked Mount Rushmore is because there was a lot of eastern exposure from the sun. And that sun cast really interesting shadows on the surface of the rock. And Borglum, as an artist, knew, knew about Chiado Scudo, the, the, the play of light and shadow on a surface. And he knew that when those faces were sculpted, if you looked at them at 10 a.m. and then if you looked at them at 2 p.m., it almost looked like the expression would change because of that light play on the shadow. That's really one of the reasons why he picked Rushmore. But you should also know that when he picked Rushmore, geologists did a study, and their report said, do not carve on this mountain. There is too much pegmatite stone. You'll have nothing but problems. Well, Borglum was an egomaniac and a, a real hardhead, and he somehow suppressed those documents and went on with the carving. Uh, but, you, but as you saw from uh, Luigi's storytelling aspect, they had a lot of problems. So that's where it was born out of the geology. Oh, Prego. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. The ones in the photographs? Yeah, those are, uh, half of them are with me, and then half of them are with my uh, oldest sister. So they're, they're, they're at home. But the, the, the bust of Luigi has spent the past year in the rotunda of the capital of New York in Albany as part of a larger exhibit about uh, immigrant uh, contributions to New York. And my grandfather represents the Italians, which is really exciting. But I miss that bust. I want it to come home as soon as it can. I like to read and, and play with his hair when I read, <laughs> with his marble hair. <laughs> yes. Uh, Borglum, Borglum had a lot to do with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's, here's Stone Mountain. Borglum, uh, Borglum was approached in like 1915, you know, 10 years before Rushmore, by the Daughters of the Confederacy to uh, carve a bas-relief of the Confederate leaders, Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, Stonewall Jackson. And uh, his uh, first chief carver was Luigi. There's my grandpa, younger Luigi, working on Robert E. Lee's face. But the, but the project was ill-fated because um, there was a silent partner behind the Daughters of the Confederacy called the KKK. They were financing a lot of it. And they told Borglum under no conditions was he to disobey their wishes. And their wish was to add to that bas relief a slave in chains on their knees thanking their master for a great life. Borglum refused. He smashed the models which were the property of the KKK and the daughters, and they sent the police after him. And there was a high-speed chase in the middle of the night. Borglum had to get out of Georgia or else he would go to jail. And it was around that time when Don Robinson started paying attention to this renegade, this, this tenacious uh, sculptor. And he thought, this is the kind of guy that I would need to, to achieve this mountain sculpture. He's the only one that could probably uh, you know, do something like this. So yeah, that's a very strong connection. Um, yes? A favorite president? Oh, hands down, Lincoln. Oh, Lincoln, yeah, you see he did the mosaic. Um, he, in his interview, there's an interview that you can find on the website, his last interview, where he says, I know every bump, every ridge, every line of that face so well. And it makes sense why he would love Lincoln. Lincoln had a very angular features. What a fun face to carve, right? I mean, my grandfather was said, he says, you know, carving babies is all well and good. But think about a baby's face. It's very round and cherubic and smooth. But carving Lincoln? Yeah, no, it was, it was by far Lincoln. Um, any erosion? Borglum said the reason he picked this mountain was because the stone, the good stone, the carvable stone, was so hard 
that in 10,000 years, the faces would lose about a half an inch. So they're, they're here for a long time. And any cracks or fissures that develop in the faces, uh, there's a resin that Borglum actually invented, a uh, combination of like limestone and sand and some other ingredients. And every spring, the, the, the park rangers get on their bosun seats and they bounce around and they fill every little crack so that when the winter comes, you know, water won't get in, won't freeze, break apart, you know the deal. So the, the faces are very well maintained. No, those faces are going to be around for a long, long time. Yes, ma'am. How did it get named Mount Rushmore? There's a legend about this. It's kind of funny. So when the legend becomes fact, you print the legend, right? In the 1890s, a, a, a lawyer from New York um, named Charles Rushmore, uh, his, his, his law firm had interests in some of the silver mines, and he was sent out by the law firm to investigate uh, an issue with some of, the, some of the mines. So he was being led by some native Keystone men on donkeys, and he happened to notice this impressive mountain, and he said, wow, that's a beautiful mountain. What, what, what do they call that mountain? And then one of the men jokingly said, yeah, we're going to name it after you. And they did. <laughs> And it, it started out as a joke, but the joke grew legs, and it stuck. That's the legend. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but it's the story that people love to tell. Um, yes? It was financed by the United States government to the tune of uh, something like $989,000. And a lot of the money, the reason, the reason money was able to be used for Rushmore was that it was in the form of WPA money um, and CCC, Depression Era Projects, so that people would have work. Uh, and there were times when Borgman had to go to Washington to lobby to get those funds. Um, they were allocated, but they, a lot of times they weren't released. It was really a fight. That's why he needed somebody like my grandfather in charge. Yes? Oh, no, they're not happy at all. Yes. Um, I'm not an expert on the history of the Native American experience, but I know enough to say that the generation of Native Americans that were alive during the carving of Mount Rushmore were a generation of people that went through the white uh, schools. They had their language beaten out of them. They had their culture beaten out of them, and they were really, really docile. And some of them were probably drinking and, and asking for change on the streets. So they were not the same people that their grandchildren were who ended up protesting, you know, like Leonard Peltier and um, Russell Means. Uh, their grandchildren were the ones who, who, who spoke out against uh, uh, Rushmore and said that, uh, that not only was this stolen land by the U.S. government, but they were desecrating their whole papas, uh, um, Papa Sapa, I don't know if I'm saying that right. That's that they're Lakota for like their fathers. These are their ancient fathers that belong. They should be, um, they should be recognized. So yeah, they, they see it as a desecration of uh, their holy land. And that's why I said at the beginning, there are people who feel differently about Mount Rushmore and the Native Americans certainly are a representative of that. And, I, and I've had some discussions with Native Americans that have come to my show and they've made them so, so I was very clear about the way they feel and I said, I respect where you're coming from. Oh, yes, Crazy Horse. It's interesting that you bring up Crazy Horse. What a segue. Yeah. Uh, Korzak Joukowsky, he was a Polish-American sculptor, and he was hired by Borglum in 1938 to replace my grandfather. But they didn't get along because Korzak was an egomaniac just like Borglum. And he left the project and said, I'm going to make my own mountain sculpture, and it's going to be bigger and better than yours. So he went to the heads of the five nations of Lakota Sioux, and they said, You're, uh, they, are carve, they carved a, um, a monument to your white fathers. Why don't you, can you please carve one for one of our fathers? And say they chose Crazy Horse. This is the model. Okay, that's what it's supposed to look like. Do you get an idea of uh, how it's coming along? Do you see how big it is? Um, they're not accepting any government money because the, Lak the Lakota Sioux have a, a lot of input and they don't want it. That's why it's taking so long. And it's basically the sculptor's descendants and family. 
Uh, that's the face of Crazy Horse, which is finished. It's 90 feet tall, folks. So it's like really, it's like, you know, a third bigger than the Rushmore faces. And just to give you an idea of how Rushmore uh, compares in size, yeah, it's going to be tremendous, but it's not going to get done in any of our lifetimes. Yeah, so that's, um, yeah, so that's, that's Crazy Horse. Yeah, absolutely a connection there. Yes? Yes, my grandfather was trained. My, my grandfather was trained in Austria first and then Italy. Um, when he was a little boy, um, he was standing outside his, uh, my great-grandfather's wood shop because my grandfather comes from a long line of wood carvers. My grandfather was the first stone carver in the family. He carved a little horse out of wood, and my great-grandfather recognized his talent. But my grandfather said, I really want to carve in stone. So my great-grandfather did with my grandfather what many people did with their children 100 years ago. They sent them away to, to apprentice under a master artist. And I always love to ask elementary school children, you know, my grandfather was like 12, 13 years old, 11. He went away from his family for three years. Could you do that? Could you leave your family for three years? And they're like, oh. I ask middle schoolers the same question, and they're like, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, sign me up, sign me up. Yeah, right, exactly. So my grandfather studies in Austria for three years, studies in Venice for another three years, and then comes to America as a classically trained stone carver. But he honed his craft under Borglum, too. Borglum was a genius. He learned a lot, of, he learned a lot from Borglum. Yes? Uh, my uncle Silvio um, studied under my grandfather for a time, but I think he was a little overwhelmed by my grandfather's talent and kind of felt in his shadow. So he didn't, he didn't really pursue it beyond a certain point. Um, I can't say no. Nobody on the level of my grandfather. Not at all. Not at all. Yes? I do. I have uh, pneumatic tools of his. Um, Mount Rushmore, those drills that you saw, those were pneumatically uh, powered, air powered. They had to run power lines from the mountain to, to Rapid City, 20 miles away, to power them. Yeah. Oh, Mount Rushmore was a wilderness when they started. They spent two years before they even did any carving, you know, taking trees down, making roads, you know, staging the whole area. And um, the pneumatic uh, drills that I have uh, are from the same company that, that Borglum purchased from for Mount Rushmore. It's very possible that the ones in my house are, the one, are ones that he maybe bought with him to go to South Dakota to use. I don't have proof of that. I have actually talked to the historian of Chicago Pneumatic, and he said, we just don't have the receipts from those drills, so we really have no way of knowing. Oh, I know, would love. So I can't say definitively, but there are just so many parallels. I mean, the, the tools are made by Chicago Pneumatic. Borglum bought his tools from Chicago Pneumatic. I mean, it, it, my grandfather used to drive. It's very uh, conceivable that he bought his tools back and forth, uh, but we'll never know. Do I have a little Luigi? No, I don't. <laughs> should, I, should I get on that? <laughs> yes. Solon Borglum? Oh, yeah, Solon was a really brilliant artist. Of 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 Solon that the Solon did. Yes, he did a lot of Western characters and uh, sculptures and paintings. He's actually rated higher than his brother Gutson in the art world. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's amazing, right? What a great story. So he discovered his grandfather. Wow. Well, God, better late than never, right? <laughs> yes. Hi. He was um, 77. He, he, died, um, he died from that terrible disease that many people who work with stone, it's called silicosis. You work with stone and the silica from the dust just gets in your lungs and you can't get rid of it. Uh, this is a reason why my grandfather went to, to back to Italy many times because in the, in, the, in the Italian Alps way up north, it, it's easier to breathe the air. Um, uh, but he lived a lot longer than many men did. He was tough. My grandfather was tough, was strong, con strong constitution. A lot of the guys who worked on Rushmore died in their 40s, probably because <laughs> they were probably getting black lung disease from working in the coal mines, and now they're getting silicosis, so they had like a double whammy. But my father always <laughs> loves to tell this story that even though my grandfather was like dying, his lungs had literally turned to stone, on his deathbed he pulled my father to him, and he's like, Vincenzo. Bring me a woman. <laughs> so my grandfather was a real Latin lover. He really <laughs> yes. Oh, I was, just, I was just six years old, but you know, some things are so transformative and so profound, you just, the connection. I have relatives that I've known for many years, and I just don't have the same connection that I have. He's the first person I remember hugging me. You know, the first hug I ever got was from him because I was his grandson, and, and he won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So very, very special. Yes? Of my pants? What would you like to know? <laughs> Well, this is not my grandfather's original outfit. I wish, I wish it was. I'm sorry to disappoint you. This is called knickerbockers.com. I just, it's a golfing website. I just got lucky, and I just matched it as best I can. And you want to know something? I really like, I wish the style would come back. I think they're kind of cool, don't you? Are there any older people here, uh, gentlemen, that maybe wore these when they were kids? There you go. We have time for one more one more question or or maybe you're satisfied you're good. Oh yes. Yes, Michaela. Yes. Good question. Okay, so this is actually kind of a fun story. Uh um my grandfather uh when he went back to Bari a second time, he met another stone carver named Alfonso Scaffa. And Scaffa said, I work for the great Gutson Borglum in Stanford, Connecticut. You need to meet him. So Scaffa brings my grandfather down to Stanford. Borglum and my grandfather click, and Borglum hires him as his assistant on many different projects. Um, but before they went back to Bari, Scaffa says, come to Porchester, which is just 15 minutes away. I want you to meet my family. So he introduces my grandfather to his whole family, and he also introduces him to his little, beautiful, four-foot-eleven sister-in-law, Nicoletta Cartarelli, who my grandfather falls in love with, and they get married. And she's my grandmother, so we owe a lot to Alfonso Scaffa. He hooked my grandfather up with Borglum and my grandmother. So beside um, Stone Mountain, which was my grandfather was involved in the 20, this is a big one. That this is called the Wars of America Memorial in Newark, New Jersey. In 1926, when this was dedicated, it was considered the biggest bronze sculpture in America. Literally 40 figures from the war, from the Revolutionary War, War of 1812, World War One, Civil War. And uh, if you look at the George Washington figure in the front, the physique, that's my grandpa. He modeled for Borglum as well. Borglum loved my grandfather's legs. I, I, I don't know, you know, not in any erotic way, but he, <laughs> but he just liked my grand. I sorry. <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that was uh, something that my grandfather uh, worked with. And, and the other uh, person who helped Borglum was the Hugo Vila, who ended up working for Borglum on Rushmore and who was fired over disagreements. So those are the two main projects of Stone Mountain and, um, and the Wars of America Memorial. So 
Wow, wow. You, you are, you've been great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, a yeah, standing ovation. All right, I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Come and speak to me. Um, uh, the books are available. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure how long the line is going to be, so if you could keep your, the, the conversation to a minimum so we don't, I, I don't want people to wait too much in line. But, uh, you know, history doesn't give you the whole story. Sometimes you have to find the truth yourself. I got to find it about some, somebody I love. Thank you for letting me tell you about my grandpa. You're great. Thank you, uh, Rochester Hills Library. Love it. <laughs>